ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode two of Bearded Time. I'm one of your hosts, Brad, the budding watch enthusiast. I am joined by Mr. Ready, Set, Watch himself, Ricardo. Hey guys, it is good to be back. I think we just um, set a record for being able to do back-to-back podcasts finally Mm -hmm. (laughs) um we've always had a problem where we do one podcast and then weeks later we like okay now it's time to do a second one but this is actually the first time we're doing a back-to-back which i think we should pat ourselves on the back for it means um (laughs) it's funny but it's part that's partly my fault because i told you um months ago when we were first talking about like doing content i'm like i don't know if i really want to do like another weekly podcast because for those of you that don't know um, that don't follow my channel on YouTube regularly. I actually do several podcasts um, that I've been doing for a long time. So I wasn't looking to add another one to the weekly grind. And then as it happened, we just kept doing like not even podcasts. We just like, hey, big news happened. Let's talk about it for an hour every other week. Mm-hmm. And then it finally you were just like, hey, let's do a podcast. And I'm just like, yeah, all right. <laughs> it's, it's pretty. It's pretty much happening anyway. So. Let's, uh, there you go. Let's there you go. Happen. No, I think I think um, I think we got something going on here with bearded time. I think if we just stick to the schedule that we we gave ourselves, I think we really have something going on. And I think this week's list of topics are going to be really interesting. Oh, we were um, graced. We were graced with two uh, huge, huge news stories. Yeah, and then a topic that both you and I. Are, are very passionate about, uh, aside from these two mm-hmm. stories. So, so um, you want to just jump into it? Yeah. So uh, the... Ooh, oh, wait oh, one oh, second. We almost missed it. We almost, <laughs> almost missed it. Almost. I'm terrible at this as well. Um, it must be a watch with us uh, disease because I know John is also terrible at this. Uh, mm-hmm, yes, we mm-hmm. have to do our wristwatch checks. Yes, yes. For the yes. week. Uh, um, I'll, I'll let you go first. Go ahead. Uh, I'll let the audience take a wild guess what I'm wearing. I, I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine what could possibly still be <laughs> on your wrist right now. Um, it is, of course, the ECA Calypso Sport. Um, I have a Tudor Black Bake steel in my collection, and it is giving me the evil eyes for the past month. Like, when are you going to wear me again? You dirty, dirty man. <laughs> when are you going to finally put me back on? Because all you've been wearing is that damn micro brand watch. How dare you? And I look back at it and I say, you'll be all right. I love this right now. Your time will come. Here's, um, here's a question. Uh, do you give your watches nicknames? You know, I, I, there was a time where I gave them nicknames. Like, okay. Well, I think only one of my watches has a nickname, mm-hmm. and that's the Black Bay. I, but the nickname for the Black Bay is Baby. Um, like, Bay as in B-A-Y, B-Y. Mm-hmm. So the Black Bay is Baby. Um, I don't know. I've seen Dirty Dancing way too many times. But uh, definitely, that's the, that's the nickname for the Black Bay. And then I really, I mean, some would call the other one the Honeymooner, because mm-hmm. I always you know, talk about how I got it on my honeymoon. Um, so I guess I do give them nicknames. I just don't realize it. Um, but this one doesn't have a nickname yet. I, 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 I don't know what I'm gonna call this one. Um, can I, can be- I humbly suggest, uh, the polar bear could possibly be one. I, I actually, that, that, that sounds good. That sounds good. We'll see if that sticks. We'll okay. see if that sticks. We'll try uh, it out. For, for I, I don't, I don't have a nickname for my wristwatch check either. Uh, I'm wearing the blue ceramic uh notice avalon <laughs> make a version with a date on it <laughs> no don't make a version with the date on it. it's not necessary they're going to by the way like they've already talked about the fact that oh they, yeah that they're yeah going to, but it's yeah. it's uh no this, I, I watch, this watch is perfect without a date you don't need a date on this watch oh no i uh, uh, call it. it's not necessary no it's not please necessary. make one with a date on it and color match it like you do please 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 ricardo, um, ricardo earlier today from the bearded watch instagram <laughs> which by the way if you're not following uh us on instagram uh you can check us out at bearded time uh mm-hmm. what what was the watch you posted was a seiko was it a, was it a presage 
It, it, no, it was um, a manual wound spring t- um, uh, sp- uh, blah, 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 spring drive. Um, if you remember last week, I, I complained about how all the manual wound spring drives are like over 50K and they're mm-hmm. in precious metals. Um, and then, of course, um, today, uh, one, of my, um, one of my friends on Instagram, uh, the Minuteman, uh, he posts about, uh, he posts a picture of the manual wound movement, the spring drive movement on this one. I think it's SBGY003. Um, and basically it's my grail. It's what I was talking about a grail watch. But of course, like we always do, I found something that doesn't work for it. And so, it doesn't have a date. <laughs> right. So, so they make it where it doesn't have the power reserve that you don't like. Yes, which is nice. Oh, yeah. beautiful, it's in the back. It's beautiful, in the back. Beautiful textured silver dial. And you're just like, well, I wish I had a date window. And I said, I, I wish that it had a date window that was black back just to spite you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. I can't help it. it, it I don't know. It, it's almost like I feel it's a slap in the, in the face. Once you get to a certain price range on a watch, I need more complications, man. Like, I, I, I like, like, <laughs> Like, like, it's funny. I, I tend to go the other way. Like, like the fancier, the nicer a watch is, I actually like the simplicity uh, a uh, little bit more. So. See, three, three hands over over six k. Now, man, give me a complication. Throw in a date, man. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Date at six. Mwah. Uh, but but uh, uh, enough uh, about. <laughs> well, actually, actually, that tra- that transition just nicely uh, into ah. talking about the fact that uh, the Basel World twenty twenty Exodus continues. First oh, yeah. we had first we had a uh, Swatch Group last year, mm-hmm. then and we Brightly. had Brightling earlier yep. this year, and now, to no surprise at all, to me, we have Seiko saying bye bye so long farewell. Why aren't um, you surprised? Or Fido saying, um, we you guys remember um, watchers us uh, earlier this year we went to Basel. Um, it was a great opportunity. It was me, John. Um, we also had uh, uh, Archie Custer from um, Vortic. He, uh, he was there with us as well. Uh, three musketeers, basically. We had a good time. Um, and ever since I found out I was going to Basel, which was early January of this year, um, you know, I did some research. So by that time, we already had Swatch Group say, oh, we don't know. I'm out. And a lot of people thought, myself included, that, okay, you know what, there, here goes a, a big, large amount of space gone from the first floor, which is, is Swiss only. Mm. Uh, basically, they only keep Swiss brands on the, on the, on the first really? floor. They don't have yeah. any? Al- that's interesting. Okay. Nope. Nope. Everybody gets relegated to the second. Everybody else gets relegated to the second floor, wow. which is okay. which is going to lead into why I'm not surprised. Well, well, now this makes a lot more sense. I'm already I'm already kind of seeing down the path a little bit. So so Seiko felt slighted that they didn't get prime placement, so, even though that a huge actually it's it's a it's it's in many ways it's a double it's a double it's a double like imagine the 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 old school uh, I challenge you to a duel <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a it's a double smack. Um, so that space opened up last year. Many people in the industry thought, okay, this is a great time. Grand Seiko, Seiko are doing some amazing things. Let's put them on the first floor. Mm-hmm. They have amazing pieces. Um, you know what? Hey, you know, it, it's a great brand. This would be a great opportunity for the brand. You know, I think it will really show how we as Basel are moving forward. Let's put them on the first floor. Nope. What they do instead, they oh, create this large press center, which I didn't mind, by the way. Definitely had mm. many a, a mills in that press center. So I was happy with there. But if I'm, if I'm talking in turn regards, if I'm in the shoes of Seiko, I kind of feel slighted. Because mm-hmm. that, that was a perfect example to be like, Seiko, Swatch, which took with them multiple brands, mm-hmm. left a, a, a large amount of space open. Prime example. Let's put Seiko in. And they don't. Second like cool. Okay. Well, I've been on the second floor for, for a couple of years. So it's, it's all good. They get relegated to the second floor. Uh, nice space, by the way. Really nice space. Them and Citizen had some a great, great space on the second floor. So they get relegated to the second floor. And then now you have Brightling. 
mm-hmm. which was on the first floor. Now they said, I do Ovido Center as well. And they're gone. Breitling leaves another opportunity for you now to look forward and say, hey, Seiko, Grand Seiko, you've had a hell of a year, guys. Hell of a year. Let's put you on that first floor like we know you, like we all know you deserve. And I'm willing to bet, it would like, um, like we've been reading, uh, because Basel has been a bunch of brands and kind of show them their vision. Uh, this year, 2020 is going to be them implementing the first steps in their vision. Mm-hmm. And they probably brought Seiko in and say, here's our vision. Here's what we plan to do. Seiko's sitting there like, oh, well, okay. Hmm. Second floor again. Hmm. I see. Okay, cool. Cool. Not only that, but they move Basel to the time that Seiko is going to be celebrating the 60th anniversary of Grand Seiko. Mm -hmm. So Seiko already has plans like, okay, this is a great, great thing we're going to be celebrating. So in, if you're a Seiko, you're sitting there and you're saying, okay, you know what? I'm already treated like a second class citizen when I go to your, to your, um, to your fair. You make me pay millions for the space at that fair. I've already spent a year doing these cool national and and regional kind of meetups, which I'm probably spending less than a tenth of what I spent for that booth at Basel. Why am I still going to Basel? Hmm. You know, uh, no, no, I'm done. I'm done. Finito. I I, I don't need to be there. Why? Why? I, I get more, I get more accomplished and I build a better rapport with my followers and the and, and, and my consumers through these smaller more regional events which a lot of brands have been doing don't don't get me wrong seiko wouldn't be the first to do this and i think a lot of brands have started to realize that they get a, a much larger return on investment doing these smaller regional events than they would um, a big fair like basel especially when you take into account the cost mm-hmm. travel Staying in Switzerland is not cheap during that time. You start adding it up and it just doesn't make sense for the brand. And Seiko has reach. It's not like Seiko needs to take everyone from Japan to do a regional event in the United States. They have Seiko Corporation US. Right. They they already have groundwork here. So why why do they need a big show like Basel to really show off their wares? Right. And and it's funny because I I've talked about this on my channel too. You're, you see, I, the other one of the other things that I'm not that I'm an expert on watches, but one thing I am an expert in is the video game industry because that's been something that I've been kind of neck deep in my whole life. You're seeing the same thing going on with the E3 show in video games. E3 is basically the Basel world of the video game industry, mm-hmm. but you're seeing more and more big companies. Uh, it started with Nintendo like five years ago, just not coming to the show and not doing like a big press conference like they're accustomed to doing every year. And instead, now when Nintendo has like big stuff that they want to announce, they do a YouTube video basically that's pre-recorded that they just send out directly to anyone to watch basically. And that goes for not only enthusiasts, but also for media and also for, I'm sure for, you know, corporations and stuff like that and, and vendors and things of that nature that, that they're selling to. And this year, this past year, Sony also did not go. Uh, to E3 as well, which was enormous. Like when Nintendo left, that was one thing. Sony leaving and not co- and not coming this year was seismic. And I, I understand what you're saying. The, the feeling slighted probably does factor into it. I didn't know that story. Um, or I, I didn't know that that's how the relationship was, or at least how the structure was at the show. But mm-hmm. also too, I mean, you could argue, and it didn't just start because of this, but every single thing that you and I have talked about when we've done these videos together has generally been instigated by a Seiko announcement of some kind. It just, it just happened to be that way so far. So I would, I dare say that Seiko is doing a really good job of getting their message out there by themselves. They don't need to, as you say, pay millions of dollars to rent space, space, right at, at Basel world. Now, Basel's not just for press. Actually, press is probably the least important part of Basel World. That's also where, you know, their buyers who is who are watch, you know, sellers also gather and congregate. 
So I can understand maybe that's probably not a great idea. But like you said, as much as they're paying for this, I can't imagine that it would be that much more expensive, if not cheaper, to just fly those people out to your own event that you're doing. To, to, to tell you the truth, it's, I don't, from what I've heard, I don't even think it's close in terms of expenses mm-hmm. for, for Basel. It might be a, a, a percentage. Like I'm, I'm talking less than 30%. To mm. do these small regional, regional events instead of doing those that huge, um, Basel, uh, it's it's not even close. So once again, as a brand, you're sitting there and you're just like, what am I really getting for my return on investment? Um, and you know what? I understand. I understand. I understand why. Why basically, Seiko just said, that's it. Like I I can't really. I can't really do this anymore. I can't really do this anymore. So, I mean, it, it's big news because, of course, I think it's bigger news because of just how much Grand Seiko has been in the news recently. Right. I think that's, that's another reason why it really hit for a lot of people. Like, oh, Seiko's not going to be there? I think a few years ago, Seiko not being there would not have, this, would not have had the same <laughs> as, as it does now. Um, but still, I mean, it, as a growing brand, you take all those things that I mentioned, you're just like, no, uh, why, why, why go through the headache? Why, why deal with, 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 I mean, it's basically building a, an office building at Boston. Mm-hmm. That's how big these spaces are. They're there like days, days in advance, building, fully building. I mean, if, if, if you brought that here to the United States, we're talking, think of it like a, a $10, $15 million home. Right. And, it's, and I've seen, like, I've seen, obviously, video. I've seen pictures of those. The most extravagant trade. I mean, essentially, they're trade show booths, essentially. But they're the most extravagant ones that I've ever seen. Really cool, though. Like I said, I, I, hope, to, I hope to get to check that out at some point. Um, it'd be really dope. But, yeah. I, and, and, but, like I said, when, when you say it makes perfect sense, and especially if the, the organizers weren't going to even put them – in what you would consider to be like a prime position. I mean, I'm sorry, like you, you, I understand you might want to keep the first floor entirely Swiss brands, but Seiko, I feel is a company that's worthy of that stature, especially with the grand Seiko brand and what's happening with that right now to be amongst those other brands. So that, that actually makes a lot of sense if that is indeed uh, the reason that, uh, or part of the reason why they're not doing it. They say it's because the timing of the show uh, does not line up for them, which is a very corporate, uh, very cool it, it's, so. it's a nice it's a, it's a nice excuse it's a, it's a nice it fits perfectly it's a nice excuse but um yeah it's 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 gonna be it's gonna be weird to not see them there um and, and the, the crazy thing I, early this year i was just like oh man this sucks you know as a media guy now you have to go to all these different locations and someone um actually adam from um from um from red bar mm-hmm. uh he said it perfectly he's like dude it's what we do like it's it's yeah. if, if this is what you want to do it, it it you go where the watches take you um so I, I no longer complain about this because if you think about it swatch has its own thing now um brightly is gonna have, does its own thing they did something early this year uh seiko has its own thing it is what it is. It's what we do as guys who are in the watch media realm. Right. Um, and, but... and, and they're still, and like the, the larger, I mean, obviously like watch with us, we're not nearly at that stature. Oh at yeah. Point, yeah. But like your hood inkies, your worn and wounds, like your, your outlets like that, they're going to go to. To, to whatever you need to. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and you know what the, the good thing is the information gets out there. You can still report on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't always have to have them like feet on the ground because the information just gets out there. Um, but as time progresses, like puzzle is just losing more and more and more. And it's going to get to a point where you're just going to be like, okay, like what, what is there really left to see? Well, I think, uh, I think you'll still have, uh, there, there's still a necessity because again, it's still a central location where many brands can congregate to with their buyers and and that's still going to be important because not like we we talk about the the mega corporations in the watch industry your seikos your swatch groups your brightlings 
and and Rolex obviously would fall in there as well, and there's several others, but there for every one of those, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think isn't there like three or four brands that are of a much smaller stature that don't have the the cachet to be able to just, you know, have their own events and fly people out everywhere, that sort of thing. So it's it's yeah. still gonna be nece- necessary for those mm-hmm. brands for sure. But I, I, I understand where you're coming from saying that, yeah, as far as for the big brands, like when they can control the message themselves, when they can deliver it on their timetable, um, the, the, the necessity for a central show for them uh, definitely lessens. And I think, I think the big one would be if Rolex were to, were to pull oh. that would be, that would, that would be, that would be like pulling oh, the plug oh, oh, oh. all the way oh, out of the grid. So. Oh, my goodness. That, I think that's a Microsoft level exit. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, let, let, let us not, let us not speak such things into existence. <laughs> <laughs> let, let's, let's leave that, let's, let's leave that alone. But that would be, that would be, yeah, yeah. Between Rolex, then of course, Twitter would leave. Oh, oh yeah. we don't even want to think about that. We don't even want to think about that. But it's interesting, talking about Seiko kind of leads us into our next topic, which a lot of people equate with Seiko, which is value. Mm-hmm. Um, we, were, we were thinking about topics for this week's episode, and I, I think one thing that kind of stirs a lot in, in the, of emotion and, and thought in both of us is when you get into the discussions of watches and value. Uh, I, I mentioned it to you, it's... It's an interesting discussion because a lot of times you hear people say, oh, that, uh, that watch has a lot of value or uh, it's a lot of value for your money. Mm-hmm. Um, you hear that, that phrase almost all the time. And what we wanted to really just talk about was how do you truly define value when it comes to a wristwatch? And, and we're thinking about things that regardless of, of the cost of the watch, you know, value at 50,000 value at 500. Like, how do you truly define value for a watch? And you know what, Brad, I'll, I'll let you kind of start and, and we could see, see where we, where we both kind of sit on this. Well, I, I, I know you said regardless of cost, but I, I do think cost when you're, when you're talking about value is important because there are certain like value propositions that I would expect to get from a watch that costs twenty thousand dollars, that I wouldn't necessarily expect to get from a watch that costs five hundred dollars, mm-hmm. for example. So, like for a watch that costs five hundred, um, like resale value wouldn't be very high up on my list of mm-hmm. of important things. But if I'm buying a watch that costs twenty thousand dollars, that might factor in a little bit more um, to, into the equation a little bit. I, and so for, for my, for my wheelhouse, like obviously most of what I buy is going to be in like the sub thousand dollar range. That's, that's kind of where, where I dine out basically. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's, it's really a sum of, of the parts of the watch. And I hate when, I hate when people get really fixated. So I, I just did a review on my channel of, of the Roebuck Diviso. Roebuck watch company is a new micro brand company and the Diviso is their debut watch. Saw them at district time a couple weeks ago and mm-hmm. and they sent me the prototype and reviewed the watch and i heard there was a comment in in the youtube comments on the video where some dude was like was like roasting me because like i'm reviewing you know i dare say that a watch that has a miyoti 9015 movement that costs 600 dollars is is ridiculous like what a ridiculous thing for a watch with a miyota movement to cost that much money i can't believe mm-hmm. that that's that's and insane and that dude has no perception on what makes a great wristwatch the movement is such a small aspect of where the value of a watch comes into play in my opinion and i think it's actually a overvalued asset especially in the sub thousand range for sure i i i think i think okay i agree with you in the sub thousand range it, it's overvalued um i think a lot of people also don't realize the cachet a movement like that has mm-hmm. um so often you see and these are your guys who are just like Swiss invest type of guys. Um, they, they, they you compare like a 90, 15 to your 28, 24 and they'll, they'll just like, Oh my gosh. Uh, uh, oh, the 20, 24, so much more. Dude, dude, that the 90, 15 is a amazing competitor to that movement. And in some aspects almost beats that movement so 
so that's one thing when it comes to value that, you know, a lot of people that, that irritates me as well. Mm -hmm. um, when you start dealing with that though, once you get past the movement and then, mm -hmm. especially in a sub sub one K zone, I then try to see, okay, I, I have, a, I think I have a pretty good idea of, of what a 90 15 will cost you. Mm -hmm. Which, which is fair by the way. I, I, and I think that is okay to kind of have like a, like a zone, I guess you could say zone. That, ex, that, that sets an expectation. That's and then when you, so like, let's say you take a but watch. That, oh, but, go ahead. But, Sorry. But, yeah. but, 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 not so much his own like that's that kind of gives me my base right so I, so i know that this is this is the base this is this is in my mind you have that movement this is the base cost that i expect for a watch the rest of that i'm now looking at, at there's a small percentage of that that that's tied into uh, the cachet of the brand Mm -hmm. You know, can I trust you in a couple of years? Where are you in your, in your, in your, in your um, progression? You know, the, that kind of builds into it. I mean, a lot of people will tell you, oh, all you need to do is service um, the movement. So you shouldn't really worry about that. But there's a lot more that goes into the watch for me than just the movement. So I've established that base, that that's the base value that I'm looking at. But then I'm trying to see what, where did you add more to that watch mm -hmm. to justify that cost? Well, and, le and let me, so that's, that's one thing that I find with a lot of folks that when you do talk about value, I don't think enough importance is placed on design. I think people completely overlook the design aspect of the watch and they go right to just nuts and bolts. Like what components are in this watch and is it is it worth the money that you're spending the perfect the perfect example that I will always forever bring up in this conversation is anything that NTH puts out basically so I have an NTH knack and renegade mm -hmm. that it's a $650 watch that's how much the watch costs brand new and it's got a Miyota 9015 in it so there's mm -hmm. automatically a huge a, a not insignificant subset of people that would be like too expensive for a 9015 Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. But one of the next things you have to look at, and this was one of the things that made the watch very desirable for me. It's so funny, this, the stuff that, that we all, that we get geek out about and kind of mm -hmm. stuff, stuff. But one of the things that made the watch desirable, it is one of the thinnest mm -hmm. go to 9015 watches that exists in the marketplace today. Divers. It's, right, divers. Yeah, specifically. Dive watch that exists in the market today. It is, I think it's, and Chris is going to beat me up if I'm wrong. I think it's like right around <laughs> 11, 11 millimeters uh, mm -hmm. in height, which you typically do not see from micro brand watches that have 9015s in them. And in hearing, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to know Chris outside, of, you know, separately, and I've heard the story mm -hmm. on how that watch came to be, or the, or the whole, the whole, you know, NTH subline came to be. Mm -hmm. And just the back and forth saying, no, we got to make it thinner. No, we got to make it thinner. And like the, 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 you know, the case manufacturer telling him we're never doing this for another person because this was such a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. Like that, I, I appreciate that. Like that's, yeah. that's where some of that added value is coming. But it play. comes into, and I think I always laugh when people don't take into account the design of the watch mm -hmm. because straight off the bat, when I, when I meet someone and they don't take into account the design of the watch, I know they're only purchasing that watch for the for the for the lore of the brand mm -hmm. because at the end of the day you have to look at that thing all day every day it's much in the same way no matter if people tell you oh, love at first sight guess what you have to see the person first <laughs> before you talk to them before you, a word was uttered you looked you saw you liked so how can we take something that's the first step in every watch purchase that we make and we just push it to the side like it's nothing uh, if i don't like how a watch looks in other words the design of a watch how am i buying that watch i don't care what's inside <laughs> so so if that's the first thing i'm looking at how do we not then equate to the that to the importance of, of that aspect which i think a lot of people just just throw to the wayside so for me once i've got past the the, the movement 
Um, which, of course, once again, that's not the first thing I, I, I see. It's not like, oh, 9015 is posted on the picture of a watch when the first time I see it. The first time <laughs> I see it, I'm looking at the watch. So for me, of course, it's design. So I'm looking at that watch and I'm saying, and this is me personally, how much wear can I get out of that watch? Yes, I, I, and I'm just talking about me. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of people who are more different. There are people who like big, unique pieces, out, like, out there pieces, pieces. But for me, when I equate value, I look at a watch and I say, how much wear can I get to that watch? So is that something I could wear like four or five days a week? Mm -hmm. um, from, from a boardroom to, uh, to a, a pickup uh, pick game of, of basketball to, well, maybe not the pickup game of basketball. I was about to say, like, you know, you're, you're wearing your <laughs> mechanical watches on the, on so, the hardwood. <laughs> yeah. So more like from the boardroom to like a, a beer, grabbing a beer with my friends um, and rolling my sleeves up. I, I look at a watch for that. So that's why a lot of times when I look at watches, I look at muted tones. I look at grays. I look at blacks. I look at whites. Mm -hmm. I look at things that can, that, that, that can work in multiple occasions. So for me, straight off the bat, that's a piece of value for me. Another thing that's a piece of value for me is certain complications, a la the date will. So that adds value to me. So these, all these things taken, and taken together outside of just the movement of the watch are things that add value to the watch for me. So I, 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 so I have my base, of course, the movement. I have the design. I look at the design. I like the design. So once I've, I, I've gotten to the, the, and I like the design, I look more into what's incorporated into the, into the design. So with NCH, you have the fact that he, he pushed forward and created a thin diver watch that's at an affordable price for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. And with, the, with really cool just watch designs. For me, I also look to see, so that's, that's, that's value right there. But if it was another brand, I'm seeing, okay, what materials did you use? Um, you know, like, how did you, did you use a, a, a sapphire crystal? Um, or, or do you have a see-through case back? If you don't, like, what's the design on the, on the case back? And I'm, I'm, all these things are building a, a, a picture for me in terms of value for the watch. Because then that'll separate the watch between something uh, I, I'm, I'm just buying real quick and I'm just like, oh, this is cool or something I'm buying and I could potentially keep for a longer amount of time. So all those things are built into value. Um, and it, it, it's those things that like design, um, it, the design just plays such a large role into it. When, when, I, when you really stop and think the design of a watch plays a really large role. And once you, especially once you get past 1K, where there's only so much you can do with a movement, you're past 1K, you're dealing with either movements that are, 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 are top of the line edas mm -hmm. or in-house movements. And, and even top of the line Myotas, so in some signature series Myotas. But for the most part, you're dealing with top of the line edas and top of the line in-house move, movements. Um, now I start thinking about, I start thinking, going back to movements again. Okay. What's the value behind an in-house movement that will require a certain uh, watchmaker to look at for mm -hmm. it to go to a certain place, for it to be a certain cost versus the value of, of me being able to just send it because it's, it's an ETA to any watchmaker that I trust and having him do that. Because well, now see, I have to build that into value. Well, see, for me, it's not necessarily about the movement that's in it per se and more so the and again we're talking still like probably sub three thousand i'd say okay. right yeah um it's not the movement that's in it per se but how accurate is that movement like i don't care if you put a salita you know sw330 in there that's fine like mm. like the monta sky quest has a salita 330 in yes it. but i forgot yeah salita yeah. as well i forgot i mentioned just edda and, and in-house so salita as well right but it's adjusted to be essentially within what cosc certification would be where they said send down and get it mm -hmm. cosc certified it's like it's plus five or minus five per day so like if you're putting in like a elaborate grade you know eta in a twenty five hundred dollar mm -hmm. watch i'm not gonna be as <laughs> as keen as keen to kick out that money for something that you know i can only expect that that has a much wider range of accuracy 
But you know, yeah. certainly if you're going to take the time to, to fine tune that movement, even if it is a shelf movement, I'm totally okay with that as long yeah. as it performs well. Yeah. I mean, and, and then that brings it to, so in that case, you have that at a, that elaborate, um, at a, I mean, if, if the watch that it's cased in is a sexy beast, I might not be as worried about uh, the, 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 the timing on that movement as compared to it just being like a, a, a basic looking watch. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of an example um, of, 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 of uh, oh, I'll, I got a great example. Um, John used to, uh, John had a brand, um, Gorilla, Gorilla watches, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where the cost, uh, uh, the, I know a lot of people would complain about the movement inside the watch. I, I think one of the earlier watches they created had 8215s in it. Okay. But the watch itself was, in terms of design... Right, that's a watch where you are, like a Gorilla Fast Pack is definitely a watch where you are paying for that design. Like that you're paying like you're for paying. the design. Right. So you might not be happy with the movement. Once again, you fall into another situation where you're looking at the watch. The first thing you're looking at is the watch. And you're just saying, okay, that, that I see where that cost went. I might not agree with it. I might not like that. I might still want a 9015 in, in there, but I'm not going to sit here and say that's not worth it because it has 8215 in it. I'm going to say, okay, you know what? There's the value. The value is in the design. And, 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 and there it is. So I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to complain and then complain about it. We've taken a very roundabout path to figure out that you and I uh, base a lot of what we consider value on emotion. It seems like just from just from kind of looking at it, especially. <laughs> which which is crazy because I think this is a very emotional hobby. Mm-hmm. Watches is a very emotional hobby. I mean, if you've ever talked to John when he's talked, to, if you ever caught John talking about Langa, you see the passion he has for watches. Like he loves those things. He loves those movements. I mean, he 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 knows. He knows watchmakers like we know stars on basketball teams. Mm-hmm. Like that's a passion he has for watches, and and as and I think that comes from years of experience and 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 and, and just being in the industry. And it's really it's somewhere I'd love to be. Um, like after years of getting to know everything, um, but yeah, it is a very passionate thing. So once again, now that's another that's another thing that's tossed into value. I mean, what does that watch elicit? Uh, what does it stir in you? What does it create in you? And is it something that's long lasting or is it something that's kind of short term? Um, but I, I think getting back to the whole idea of value and the mistakes people make when it comes to really, really placing value of the watch, I think the number one thing we both can agree on is people don't take into account the design of the watch. Mm-hmm as much as they should. Um, I, I, I'll give you a perfect example. All the time, day and night, I hear people talk about the Rolex Explorer. Mm-hmm. And, and it's an amazing, pe- an amazing amount of value. It's a great watch. But for me, I can't find value in that watch because it doesn't really stir or elicit anything in me. And that's interesting because I'm on the polar opposite side of the scale with and it, and, and, but, and, and you see how how that is so yeah. for you for you it stirs something in you to the point where you're just like i see the value in that for me it doesn't stir something in me because i i i i i though the many will say the design is timeless mm-hmm. it just really doesn't do as much for me and of course it doesn't have a date well it doesn't do as much <laughs> of course of course. No, and, and see, for me, the, re- the reason why I love it is because, in, in my opinion, that, that is a brilliant piece of design because there is not a single superfluous aspect on that watch. Like, everything on that watch is, is very deliberate and very effective. It conveys exactly what it needs to. And no- nothing more, nothing less. And I, and I think for, for a three-hander, which I'm 
super partial to <laughs> not like ricardo <laughs> give give me a three hitter any day of the week and i'll uh, and i'll be perfectly happy uh, it, it it really speaks to me it really speaks yeah. to me and again it's not just the dial it's also the proportions of the watch um and just and just kind of how the case is as well and and for me like a submariner looks a little bit too it look, looks a little bit too deliberate on the wrist like like it, it's a little bit too uh, not mm. ostentatious is not the right word, but it, it's not, it, it's a little too in your face compared to the Explorer, which I think is a lot more elegant. Mm. And, and it's funny you say that. Um, Cause then that makes me think of another watch, which for, for me, the, the Rolex Explorer to the, the Pepsi, mm-hmm. like, I feel like that's too in your face, too out you mean, there. You mean the GMT? The GMT. Yeah. Um, but then I look like some. I look at. I I would find my, more value in the Tudor, Black Bay GMT mm-hmm. than I would in the Rolex Explorer GMT, especially the one on the Jubilee basic, the bracelet. But of course, a lot of that has to do with I like the overall more muted tones mm-hmm. of the Tudor than the blinged out in your face kind of flash of the the Pepsi. So, but then if I told, if, if I were to tell, there are, pe- there are people I've told that and they've looked at me like I, I'm crazy. Like, oh my gosh, the, the Pepsi, oh, you could buy it, but you'll make money on it. You'll make like two, three thousand dollars like that. And I'm saying, I'm like, okay, you see where you put value. And, and this leads <laughs> us to another part of, of value. People tying value into what they can, in the investment aspects of the watch them getting a return on the watch if they were ever to sell the watch. And I think that's really misguided. And it, it, but it's something a lot of people do. That's, that's how they define value. They define value as if I'm going to buy this watch today, mm-hmm. in two years, I know I could sell this watch for this. But then I'm, I'm thinking of if I buy this watch today, I know I'm not going to sell this watch. Mm-hmm. That, that, that that's value to me because it also means I'm not spending money on another watch. Well, and I have I, a watch I, I in, love. I go in a little bit more clear headed than that because I, I, I bought more watches than I care to admit that I didn't plan on keeping probably forever. I, I yeah. would say so. I, so re, so again, resale value is a consideration, but I'm never going to go into, especially in the tier that we are operating in, I'm never going to go into a, a watch purchase expecting resale value it's 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 more of it's more of what can i expect to lose Lose. on this and does that loss mean i should buy this watch new or maybe i should seek out a pre-owned model of the watch instead so that my my loss is probably pretty even or or minimized yeah i I mean i'm talking like this now but i used to be a habitual flipper (laughs) habitual flipper um I, there was a point in time where I went through 50 watches in, in about two years of, of buying and selling, buying and selling, <laughs> buying and selling. Like just, just, ooh, I like that. I buy it. And then, and then within weeks, I'm just like, oh, okay, I don't like it anymore. I sell it. And I mean, after a little while, I, I think I look back just to see how much I probably lost. And I think mm-hmm. in terms of, reselling watches i probably lost over the course of those 50 watches maybe i lost twelve hundred dollars in terms of when i sold it losing it for i mean there are watches i sold for 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 a a a nice little return and there are watches i sold and i was just like oh my gosh why is this not why is nobody buying this (laughs) and and and, oh my gosh i'm gonna have to sell it for this and I mean, I, you're, I got, you're, you're also explaining another reason why I tend to gravitate more towards uh, micro brands as opposed to, to like factory direct brands yeah. as well. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? It, it's it, another reason I kind of, I kind of rotate towards um, micro brands now because I find value in limited runs. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and for me, the fact that, like, like, quick example, the fact that I'm looking at my ECA and I know me and probably another, only a, another hundred people have this watch, I kind of find value in that. Like, that, that's, 
and I find value and this kind of ties back to design because mm-hmm. I know only other people uh, only uh, only another hundred people have a watch that's designed and look and looks like this and it's a design that spoke to me and I know it's it's it it's not a design that's just all over the place. I think a lot that that kind of plays into the role of the explorer for me too. Mm-hmm. Um, I I hate to say it. I, I like part of me. I I I like wearing a watch that I know not everybody has. Yeah. I, I hope that doesn't make me sound like I'm like a terrible person. But it. it I, like, you, I think you, I think you might only sound terrible if if you were talking about like ah, I I. I only prefer to buy a paddock because I like owning watches that nobody else has. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, it's regardless of brand, it's, it's more model specific. So, mm-hmm. so I, I like, I like to be able to have a watch that, that kind of speaks to me. And I know that everybody, not everybody has that. I kind of find my value there. Um, and it, it's crazy because then I'll have people that tell me, well, the timeless designs and you could always sell it going back to the, you could always sell it and, and make your money back. But I've kind of started walking this hobby with the idea that I, I really think deeply about the watch that I'm going to buy and really start thinking if it's something I'm going to keep. Um, but it's crazy. Just this talk about the value and we've, we've jumped into so many different things. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and at the end of the day, it's 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 really hard to just purely define value because we're all so different. Well, it it, it is indefinable uh, because from per- it's going to vary from person to person. Like we we you know I guess kind of chastise folks who put an overemphasis on the movement that's in a watch compared to its price, but at the same time, like that's not wrong either like if that if that's if that's something that you find important for whatever reason like if you have had nothing but shoddy experiences with miyota 9015 so you won't pay more than 350 dollars to get a watch that has one in it i can't i can't write that off as being invalid like that's that's you know that's directly a, related to your experience yeah so. that's justifiable like i i can't i can't be angry at you for that um it, it it's 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 crazy the more and more you think about it, yeah it's really something up to the individual um, where they decide to place value. Um, all we can speak towards is what we is we ourselves mm-hmm. find as valuable. Um, but I, that's still, there's still some things that I think it, it, it I, I think certain things are regardless, like being able to, to, to walking into a watch purchase where the only thing on your mind is the fact that I'll be able to sell this, down the line for more money Mm -hmm. i i I think a lot of us can can agree that's a bad way to really define value not saying that you should buy a watch and just be like oh if i lose a couple thousand on it it's okay (laughs) not saying that i think regardless everyone should buy responsibly i mean if you buy a watch around at a price point that you know you're not going to take a huge hit well, and, and, and that goes, that goes into another, that, that's an important message as well. So like, you should never overpay for a watch just because you think it's, it's awesome. I will probably never own a Helios, for example, because I think their watches are awesome, but the resale value that like they go for the inflated value because they're the limited runs all the time. Mm-hmm. I just, I can't, I can't pay that much of a premium on a watch that costs, you know, like if the watch costs $700, I'm not paying nine fifty for it. I don't yeah. care how rare it is. So. Yeah. And, and in that instance, I look at that and I see the, 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 that value that's being placed on the watch is a little overinflated mm. because if the brand said that this is the value that I'm putting on the watch and then everybody out there is deciding, Oh no, I'm like, this is the value I'm going to put on a watch. Uh, no, no. The brand says this is worth this. Why am I now going to pay you an extra $300? I'm not paying you because there's extra value in the watch to me. <laughs> I'm paying you because you're just, you're, you're hitting me off with supply and demand and trying to make some nice scratch. So th- I don't find value in that. And I, I would hope that if I'm going to be buying a Helios, I'd be buying it to keep not buying it knowing that in a month or so oh, I could make some nice scratch on this. And um, it's funny because ultimately, so like we've talked before, I've, I had the opportunity to pick up one of the blue alpinists and I didn't because I knew that the only reason that I was going to pick it up was to review it 
and then sell it. I knew that I wasn't going to keep it. Sure. So I didn't even bother. Was that a stupid decision on my part? Maybe I could have actually made money mm. off of, off of that, off of that transaction and probably gotten a lot of views to the channel as well. I would imagine. Yeah. But for some reason, like in my mind, I just couldn't, I, it, it didn't feel right buying it just for that purpose. Yeah. I, I remember the morning that watch came out. I had a good 30 minute window where I could mm -hmm. still get that watch. But I did the, the, the thinking I would normally do in a week, I did in 30 minutes. Right. And I came to the same conclusion. I don't really need or want that watch. The only reason I'd be wanting this watch is because right now it's, it's hot. It, it, it's, it's hyped. It, it's, 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 it's the thing. Once I got past that, it was easy for me to just be like, okay, no, I'm not buying a watch. Um, and, and, but the, the, the thing is, and I think this is a lot of things that kind of goes with the limited editions, they, they kind of get you to put that down mm -hmm. when you know there's only so much. Like you, you, that normal work that you would do in a week, they, they get you to kind of drop your drawers <laughs> real quick. <laughs> and you're, you're, you're jumping on the watch. Um, but I mean, leading from that uh, where I think we both kind of agree how we, will, we want to define value and how just that has a lot to do with the individual. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, leading, limited editions transitions really nicely uh, into the, the one, one of one. About today. <laughs> the one of one, the most expensive watch of all time. Um, of course, we are talking about the Patek Philippe that was sold at the Only Watch Charity auction this past weekend, which I actually tuned into. It's, it's, it's weird. I, I, I thought I, I wasn't going to. And mind you, I have a newborn. It just so happened the charity lined up with the time right after he ate. So mm -hmm. he was asleep. So it was perfect. I lined it up perfectly. I was like, good. You sleep, I can watch, I can listen to it and watch this charity. And also, oh, huge, huge shout out to Revolution Watch for live streaming the, uh, the event. Um, they, oh man, I, you guys were amazing. Uh, I mean, they, they, every, most of the bigger watches in the 50 that were up for charity, mm -hmm. they, they, they had us tuned in and it was just a great job. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, but it's weird. I, I had already looked through that list um, a few days earlier and I knew like the Patek was the watch mm -hmm. that was going to be the, 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 the star of the show. I did not think it was going to be that big of a star. Well, wasn't, wasn't the high estimate like 3 million? Yes. That they said that they were, that they expected to fetch for it. And then it, and, and, and the high estimate, the high estimate goes in line with what, an earlier precious metal version sold for, which was about 2.2 .2 million. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the high estimate. So that, so I remember looking at that table and seeing, seeing the estimates and I was just like, but it was still the highest estimate of all the other watches here. So the estimate for that Patek was two to 3 million, which was easily 1.5 to 2 million more than any other watch on the list. So I had no clue. Maybe other people in the room did too. But I had no clue that thing was going to go for 10 times what it was estimated. Mm -hmm. uh, for you guys that are under a rock in this hobby that don't know, the watch eventually sold for $31 million. $31 million CHF. $31 million. And Please understand, I'm telling you million dollars for this watch. Um, when it when I was watching this live, I I it got to a point where I was just like, okay, we're good. Like like this this can't go any higher. <laughs> um, this was literally right after it broke the Daytona record of over seventeen million, mm -hmm. and I'm just like, okay, twenty we're low twenties, we're good. And then it seemed like there were two or three guys who were literally waving their big, big sticks around and saying, no, I want this watch. And once we got there, I was like, okay, sky's the limit. Um, these are billion dollar guys that are probably talking right now. I'm just going <laughs> to, let's watch, let's, 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 let's enjoy the show. <laughs> um, I, it's still crazy to think that one time piece fetched that much money.
so let me tell you something. Um, I, I want to preface what I'm about to say by saying that I understand that this was a charity auction. I'm glad that the money that was raised uh, for this watch is going towards an excellent um, cause. I think it's a muscular dystrophy. Yes. Mm. Research. Um, Research. So that, that being said, uh, it kind of bothered me a little bit because of the Daytona record thing. Here's why. So I tend to, when I'm passionate about a subject and I do, I do with sports and stuff like that, I tend to romanticize it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And there was something very kind of, kind of cool and pure about the fact that the most expensive wristwatch in the world was just this regular ass Rolex Daytona that Paul Newman's wife bought for him and got engraved. And that he wore for years, you could see it, you know, pictures of it with him in, in magazines and, and shots. And it was handed down to his son-in-law and, you know, the people kind of lost track of the watch. It became like this fabled thing in, in watch forums and among watch enthusiasts. And, and the, watch, the watch had a real lore to it. And so <laughs> there was they, a story. Right. There, there was, was a story was a behind story. it. And when they decided to put up for auction, this regular Rolex Daytona, which created a subgenre of Rolex Daytonas, basically, because of this 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 one watch was so the famous. Paul Newman, Paul Newman, right? Sold for seventeen, almost eighteen million dollars at auction. There was something really cool about that, and seeing this watch, which is a monumental achievement in watch design, in movement design. I mean, this the the Grandmaster Chime is a watch that Paddock sells. Normally, I mean, they only make like six years, we found out when doing research for the show. But this is a watch that they do sell normally as part of their as part of their catalog. But I don't know, kind of seeing it like like a watch that's almost manufactured to be this watch that fetches a ton of money. Now, mm -hmm. kind of the the record holder is is kind of it, it's it's a little it feels it feels bad. It feels bad, man. Like I, I, I like the romantic <laughs> element of the Daytona being that watch. You, you, you know, I thought about that, um, I, and you know what made me able to sleep at night? The fact that if that same watch was in that same auction, it would probably get $50 million. Really? You think so? That, that made me sleep at night. It, 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 I think the, it, it being a charity auction, I think that plays a large role into it. Most definitely. Like, there's, but, no, there's no way you're spending $30 million on that watch if it's just yeah. for as, no, especially no when, to put that in his pocket. Yeah, <laughs> especially when, when – I mean, just to give you guys perspective, the whole charity fetched over about between 38 and $39 million. That one watch represented – three quarters of all the money they bought in all the money they bought in with 50 watches that one watch sold for more than all the other 49 watches combined time times two and a half times two and a half <laughs> so so of course you know it, it it does sting a little bit that 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 it now holds the record even though you know what it is for an, a great cause mm -hmm. so it'll be cool that forever when people utter the most expensive watch they'll utter that it was for this cause mm -hmm. that is that is that is probably the coolest thing that that cause could have asked for i mean that your name will forever be uttered only the the, the most expensive watch was sold at the only watch charity um so that's cool but it, it made me it made it easier for me to sleep at night when i when i just thought that like if the Daytona, that specific Daytona, that Paul Newman Daytona was, uh, uh, was also in that same auction, not only do I think the, the Patek would not have made as much, mm -hmm. I think the Daytona would have made much more. So I think the Daytona, Daytona, Daytona would have sold for an easy $40 million. Easy. In that, in that type of atmosphere. Like, you know what the buzz was for that Daytona? Like the, oh, the, the, it was enormous. Enormous. Like, yes, the Patek sold for, for $31 million, But there wasn't a, a huge amount of buzz for the Patek. It right, the, like the, buzz, the buzz came from the fact that it, it, it was sold for the watch. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't like weeks prior everyone was talking about, oh, my gosh, that Patek is going to be on only watch charity. Oh, my gosh, can't wait to see how much it goes for. That was the buzz for the Daytona. 
that buzz for the Daytona was months. Like from the moment we knew it was going to be going to charity, from the moment that they sold it. And even afterwards, there's a buzz that comes with that watch. So it's easy for me to, 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 to take the fact that that, that that watch now holds the title as the most, you know, the most, the, the, the most expensive watch. Because one, not only do I think the Daytona would have sold for more at that specific auction, but two, right now, if, if, if those two watches were in an auction, or if you had the opportunity to buy either of those watches, mm. you would still buy the Daytona. Interesting. I don't. If 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 you're, if, pro- you're, you're probably. Right. <laughs> yeah. If if you right now, if someone came to you and you had all the money in the world, <laughs> and you could have, you could buy either one of those watches. You would buy the Daytona. You would not buy. Oh, the I, I absolutely would buy the Daytona. Yeah. You would, and I think a good a lot of us in the hobby would also buy the Daytona as well. I mean, if we had that type of money, most of us would have been, and, and, and mind you, a, a lot was talk, a lot was spoken about how the, the Patek is a one of one. Um, you know, it's in, it's in um, stainless steel and not completely. Isn't, isn't, that so, isn't that so funny, by the way? Isn't, isn't that the <laughs> ultimate irony that stainless steel version of this watch <laughs> not sold even the, for, the iced sold out. for ten, 10 times what the precious metal version of this watch goes Not for. even the iced out, blingy, blingy version but the the the, the 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 not even that version was sold for that much but a regular stainless steel version um and when i say stainless i just mean out, outer case and there's still precious metals on the inside but um At, paddock's like you think stainless steel rolex sports watches are uh over demanded so i wouldn't call that a sports <laughs> watch that, <laughs> no, that, definitely not. <laughs> that is that is the quintessential gosson gosson uh, 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 please make sure you wind the watch at least two and a half times today, and, and please return it to its clear crystal case. You're saying uh, you would not, uh, you would not take that one onto the basketball court. Oh no <laughs> way! <laughs> Service on that would probably set me back 40k easily. <laughs> on, on, on not even on a jump shot, on a dribble, just on a dribble, <laughs> <laughs> just. <laughs> just on a dribble so no i would not no i, I would not take that with me on a basketball court i wonder i wonder, I, if, I, I wonder if odell beckham would wear it during a during an nfl game we'd have we'd oh have to find gosh. out and see oh my gosh i think <laughs> i think <laughs> someone he'd get robbed in the middle of the game <laughs> in the middle of the game he'd get tackled he'd pop out and he'd be like oh my god where my watch go and some linebacker would be walking away with this this imprint of a Patek on his ass underneath <laughs> underneath <laughs> his tights. Um, no, it's 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 crazy. It's it, it's a, it's a it's a a crazy amount of money for a watch. Um, I love the fact that it was all for a good cause. I'm I'm glad it's for a good cause. I yeah. could not imagine if somebody just bought that for the sake of buying it from a private seller for that amount of money. You know the amount of cancel culture that would have happened if something like that happened? <laughs> all you would hear would, would, oh, you have all these things happening in the world and you have money for, to buy a $31 million, you should give that to charity. The guy who bought that is, you know how cool that is to be the guy who bought that? Like you, no one could say anything to you, even in a, a complete show of ostentatious wealth. You drop $31 million on a watch for charity. Literally, all that money is going to a good cause. I can't, I can't fault you for it. I can't shake my finger at you for it. You are the man for that. The I, wonder, man. I, I wonder if he's worried about the resale value on it when he bought it. <laughs> I mean, he'll be lucky if he gets maybe <laughs> 2.5, 3. <laughs> he's going he's to get at least a 90% chop off of that. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, it's it, it's 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 weird. Like I I, I it, it's crazy money. Um, it's but it was definitely for a good cost. But still, it's crazy money. Um, but it's 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 interesting when you said the the whole thing about the the Newman. I, I honestly feel that way. I really do. I think I think a Paul Newman in that type of atmosphere would have fetched more money, and the buzz would have been crazy. 
Oh, the bus, I, I mean, I can't. I, if that watch ever goes back on the market at some point, I I don't even want to think about how much money yeah. it would fetch. Whoever the the after the what happened, yeah, yeah after stuff. what happened, after someone, whoever bought, think of it this way: whoever bought the Patek was either if he if it's not the same person who bought the Paul Newman, is either not a Rolex fan, or. Or he missed out on the on the on the Paul Newman. Maybe that's <laughs> why. Maybe he's like, man, I really wanted that Paul Newman, but I had no idea that it was going on sale. Exactly. I need to buy the most expensive watch. I don't care what it is. Exactly. Give me Ooh. a brand. Exactly. So another thing I find interesting about uh, about that, and it, 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 the thought came across before we we end today's podcast. Rolex wasn't one of the brands that contributed a watch. Wasn't it all mostly like horology brands? Tudor was in there. Yeah. Oh, did they? Was was the uh, was was wasn't it the P? Did they have a P zero one there or something like that? No, 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 no. They had this all black ceramic um, black bay. Ah, sold. That's right. That's right. That's right. I just sold for like, sold for three hundred k. Oh. So they had that. That was there. But I find it interesting that Rolex was not one of the brands that contributed a watch. I mean, I. Though, you know, I find it interesting, but people always talk about how Tudor is kind of Rolex's, like, sandbox. Like, they, they have all their fun um, at Tudor when it comes to design. But I, I do find it interesting that a Rolex was was not there. Um, I, like, it, it, because think of it, there, there were other watches there. Like, there, <laughs> there was, um, I think there was an 1159 mm-hmm. that that inched its way towards 1 million, got to 1 million and (laughs) bang, that was it. It was done. Um, And and, and there were a couple of people joking that, that, that said, Oh, it's AP bidding. (laughs) 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 So it, 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 it was interesting because I mean, you have really a Holy Trinity watch company Mm -hmm. that, that has that, Think about it. You you have a Holy Trinity watch company that now owns the title of the most expensive watch, and you have a watch. I think a comp- branch brand that I think a lot of people associate with luxury that mm-hmm. has the, the the most expensive watch. And short of the 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 Paul Newman going back, it's going to hold that title for quite some time. Like most protect, likely. yeah, yeah. Here's here's how you know that this caught them completely off guard. There was forty eight or sorry, fifty lots, like you said, fifty watches sold at this event. This one was like lot twenty eight. Like you yep. like you'd think they they they'd know like save the most expensive one for last. It's your main event. Dude they'll put it, they'll put it, they'll put it in the mid card. What are you doing? Dude, I mean, there was a wrestling event. <laughs> dude, there was nothing more there was nothing funnier than than after watching all the heat that came from this watch. Like right after you see people just like, okay, that's too much. <laughs> people I, right after it was sold, I, I I swear it felt like a quarter of the crowd just say deuces. Yeah, it's <laughs> like it's, it's, like, it's like who's who sticks around for the after main <laughs> event on a UFC pay per view? Like no one. That's it. That. Yeah, no one literally. It, feel, it feels like people people just say, okay, I'm out. I'm out. You know, some some diehard people wanted to see how much the the, the tutor went for. I know a couple more people wanted to see. There were a couple independent um, watchmakers. They want to see how much those watches came for. But I think a lot of people, like, their, the main event for people in the know was the Patek. But even then, they didn't think that the Patek would have fetched $31 million. I'm going to start saying it like what's-his-name says from um, – I, it's oh. it's funny. One, one of my uh, one of my co-hosts on my video game podcasts, uh, for whenever he whenever he talks about amount of money that is millions or more, he does that inadvertently. It's hilarious. <laughs> Tell you what, million nine. <laughs> but um, but no, um, it, it was. Uh, I think um, we we covered everything. I think we agree. Yeah, on the beat. <laughs> You might hear some background noise. I, I would agree. I, I was about to say the uh, that, that's the wrap it up, uh, the wrap it up line. <laughs> so, <laughs> in the, in the as you guys can tell, head. me and Brad are real life people going through real life things. Uh, my <laughs> my real life thing is I have a newborn who right now is a little hungry and his mom is warming up some milk. Um, so that is my real life dilemma. Um, 
but uh, no, I, th- I think we covered everything. Today was a, a, good, a good day. Once again, guys, you could follow us and you could hear these recordings on the Watch With Us channel. Um, they'll be placed on YouTube and then we'll be placed, they'll also be placed on um, an Apple Podcast. Yep, in the Watch With Us feed. So make in sure the you search for feed. Watch With Us and you can find it there. Um, of um, course, on Instagram, you can follow me at Budding Watch Enthusiasts. You can follow Ricardo uh, at Ready Set Watch. He also mans uh, the Watch With Us channel account and the mm-hmm. Bearded Time account, usually, as yeah. well as me. So Yeah, yeah. so Bearded Time, um, at Bearded Time, you can definitely follow us. That's kind of um, me and uh, Brad's brainchild. Um, it's, it's a, it has some humor. Uh, we definitely go at each other a little bit. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah, those are all the avenues to find us. Yep. And of um, course, uh, definitely go to YouTube as well. When, when you subscribe to watch with us, uh, subscribe to the budding watch through these on there as well, uh, to check out my content there also. Definitely. And guys, you know, we talked about value and how we define it, um, in the comments, definitely let us know, you know, how do you guys define value? What are the things that equate value to you? And, I'm going to take that final cry as the wrap up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> definitely as a wrap up. Um, but guys, it, it was, it was nice. Um, uh, nice talking to you, Brad. Yep. Um, see you next week. Uh, you next course, week. First, I have a feeling some crazy stuff is going to happen again this week. It like always, it always does. Always does. Yep. And I'm uh, signing off with the, with the, with the bearded time move. Definitely. Feeling of the beard. Feeling of the beard. There you go. There you go. Okay, guys. We'll see you on the flip side. Take it easy.